Hello. <clears throat> Going to be reading this book here, Peter Birger's Theory of the Avant-Garde, starting with the foreword. Going to be going to about 1M. We'll see how many pages that actually gets us. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Starting the forwardism versus the avant-garde preliminary demarcations. A. Poggioli's theory of the avant-garde and its limits. <clears throat> the title of Peter Berger's book will recall to the American reader Renato Poggioli's study of 1968, which bears the same title. Although Poggioli's name is now rarely mentioned, the influence of his approach can still be seen in the most recent discussions of modernism, postmodernism, and the avant-garde. At least his approach is highly compatible with the discussion at present largely determined by post-structuralist premises. For this reason, a systematic development of the radical differences between the two directions of thought represented by Birger's and Poggioli's books may help determine those places where Berger's theory of the avant-garde could positively influence the stagnating debate surrounding modernism and the avant-garde. A rarely questioned assumption that underlies this debate is that avant-garde literature derives from the dichotomy between conventional cliched language and experimental linguistic forms that dislodge those cliches. This explanation, of course, is not unique to the study of the artistic media using language, since a similar dichotomy of conventionality versus originality has dominated the critique of other arts. As early as 1939, Clement Greenberg's essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, was in both title and contents characteristic of this tendency within art criticism. Typically enough, Greenberg, probably America's best known art critic of the 50s and early 60s, chose this programmatic essay to introduce his book, Art and Culture, 1961. Pocchioli is no exception to this tradition. In his view, the tendency of avant-garde writing to concentrate on linguistic creativity is a, quote, necessary reaction to the flat, opaque, and prosaic nature of our public speech where the practical end of quantitative communication spoils the quality of expressive means, end quote. Thus, the hermetic dark language of modern fiction has a social task. It functions as, quote, at once cathartic and therapeutic in respect to the degeneration afflicting common language through conventional habits, end quote. The, quote, cult of novelty and even of the strange, end quote, in avant-garde art has for Poggioli definable historical and social causes in the, quote, tensions of our bourgeois, capitalistic, and technological society, end quote. The bourgeois, capitalistic, and technological society of which Poggioli speaks did not, however, begin with the period of the historical avant-garde during the 20s, and certainly not with the period of postmodernism in the 50s and 60s. Poggioli's historical social derivation of the avant-garde entangles him in a difficulty. He draws a parallel between bourgeois capitalist society and the commercialization and dequalification of language on the one hand, and the avant-garde skepticism toward language on the other. If this parallel is valid, then a critical consciousness provoked by the degeneration of language as it was used in the marketplace must have already existed in the late 18th century. If, however, a connection between bourgeois capitalist society and skepticism toward language can be found in the late 18th and in the entire 19th century, then it becomes highly questionable whether Poggioli's setting up of linguistic conventionality against the avant-garde can serve as a starting point for a theory of the avant-garde. For them, the term avant-garde would have to be stretched to apply to the late 18th century and it would become an empty slogan no longer able to help us distinguish romanticism, symbolism, aestheticism, the avant-garde, and postmodernism from each other. I'll begin with the first point, the question whether there was a skeptical consciousness about language around the year 1800. One can, in fact, cite numerous remarks dating back that far, arguing that the cliched character of language is a social and historical problem. <clears throat> 
Toward the end of the 18th century, Schiller and Goethe decided to begin preliminary studies for a project on dilettantism. The notes on this project, which were never, was never completed, state, quote, all dilettantes are plagiarizers. They sap the life out of it, out of and destroy all that is original and beautiful in language and in thought by repeating it, imitating it, and filling up their own void with it. Thus, more and more, language becomes filled up with pillaged phrases and forms that no longer say anything. One can read entire books that have a beautiful style and contain nothing at all, end quote. One could easily cull similar remarks from writers of the last quarter of the 18th century. These early attacks on the degeneration of language are pervaded by an awareness of the interrelation of various social historical, socio-historical developments. Bourgeois capitalist society, mass culture, the poet's stance against this development, a consciously esoteric character of high literature, and the like. Rousseau in France, Carl Philipp Maritz and Schiller and the Romantics in Germany, and somewhat later, Wordsworth and Coleridge in England discussed the division of labor and its influence on literature, the experience of alienation in modern societies, the dequalifying effect of the instrumentalization of reason, and the domination of social interaction by exchange value, expressed by the terms self-interest, interest, amor propre, and economic egotism. The reason that these sociological themes immediately affected literature and aesthetic theory lies not so much in the sensitivity of great writers to socio-historical changes, but rather in the significance of the book market for the national economy of the 18th century and in writers' new experience of having to compete with the mass appeal of popular literature. These developments led to a confrontation between writer and commercialism, between originality and conformism, between autonomous high literature and a literature given over to the ideological reproduction of society, all of which express themselves in a critical consciousness of language. Although Poggioli does not bother to go into any socio-historical details, he nonetheless refers to these developments in general terms. One might even claim that the creation of the alienated mentality and avant-garde itself, for that matter, is a phenomenon at least notably conditioned by the practical, ideological, and spiritual effects of the sudden, relatively recent transformation of the artist's economic position. Bogiali clearly sees that the socio-historical changes he mentions and the reactions of writers to them were already developed in the late 18th century. Quote, the cult of the novelty and even of the strange, which is the basis for avant-garde's art, for avant-garde art's substantive and not accidental unpopularity, was an exquisitely romantic phenomenon even before it became typically avant-garde. End quote. At another point, he even refers to the German, German storm and stress movement. He fails to consider, however, that if the characteristics he cites are applicable to the literature of such an extensive period, they cannot function as the basis for a theory of the avant-garde in the 20th century. Poggioli's criteria are both historically and theoretically too unspecific. His arguments cannot accomplish what must be the primary task of a, quote, theory of the avant-garde, end quote, to characterize with theoretical accuracy the historical uniqueness of the avant-garde of the 1920s Futurism, Dadaism, Surrealism, the left avant-garde in Russia and Germany. B. Berger's reconstruction of art history compared with Poggioli's. Where Poggioli is unspecific, Berger is by contrast historically concrete and theoretically exact. Berger describes three qualitative changes that enable him to reconstruct three phases of art history in bourgeois society. The historical transition establishing the first phase of bourgeois art was determined by the loosening and ultimately by the severing of artists' dependence on patrons and their replacement by an anonymous structural dependence on the market and its principles of profit maximization. This shift accounted for the replacement of courtly representative culture by bourgeois culture in the course of the 18th century. After a relatively short period of optimistic euphoria in the early Enlightenment, in which writers advocated centralized planning in an attempt to plan the future and to suppress what was spatially and temporally marginal, high bourgeois culture became determined by internal gestures of protest against and separation from economic commerce. 
At least ideologically, the artistic genius isolated himself or herself from the masses and from the market. Art isolated itself in this first phase from society. At first, however, the autonomy of art established by this process was not conceived as a state of absolute separation. Rather, the art that regarded itself as autonomous during the late 18th and early 19th centuries continued to reflect critically upon society. Schiller's dramas exemplify this tendency. They derive their substance from a historical and philosophical tension between the present perceived as negative and the future containing the hope for change. Thus, the opposition between the negative and the positive, not an absolute but a question of time, determines the structure of the works themselves, whose protagonists aspire through their tragic demise to the principle of moral harmony, which cannot yet be realized as a principle applicable to society as a whole. Such literature is intended to have simultaneously a social and an aesthetic effect. Its aesthetic and psychological force should elicit those conditions in the spectator or reader, harmony between sensuality and morality, that supposedly are the individual and psychological preconditions for the construction of an ideal society. In this phase, the artistic critique of society and language did not yet imply that it is impossible to influence society by communicating meaning. However, even here, the potential for the later development of an absolute confrontation between art and society existed because of the autonomous status of art. As Herbert Marcuse argued in the affirmative character of culture in 1937, the autonomy of art had from the beginning a very ambivalent character. Individual works may have criticized negative aspects of society, but the anticipation of social harmony as psychic harmony, which is part of the aesthetic enjoyment for the individual, risks degenerating into a mere cerebral compensation for society's shortcomings and thus of affirming precisely what is criticized by the contents of the work. In other words, the mode of reception undermines the critical content of the works. Marcuse maintains that even the most critical work inevitably exhibits a dialectical unity of affirmation and negation by virtue of its institutionalized separation from social praxis. For Birger, this ambiguous status of art in bourgeois society provides the key to understanding the logic of recent art history. The contradiction between negation and affirmation, implicit in the autonomous mode in which art functioned, led to a feeling of impotence among writers, to a realization of the social ineffectiveness of their own medium, and thus to ever more radical confrontations between artists and society especially as the elements of affirmation and compensation came increasingly to influence readers' responses. This development greatly changed the effects artists aspired to make, and also the means for making those effects, the techniques of narration and the artistic treatment of language. Traditional narrative modes portraying a finite number of social agents who move through a plot that takes them from one grouping at the beginning to a regrouping at the end of the, a story only makes sense if the narratives refer critically or positively to norms and values essential to social interaction. Most critics of modernism perceive this correlation rather clearly. In The Decline of the New, Irving Howe writes, quote, when a writer works out a plot, he tacitly assumes that there is a rational structure in human conduct, that this structure can be ascertained that doing so, he is enabled to provide his work with a sequence of order. But in modernist literature, these assumptions come into question. In a work written on the premise that there is no secure meaning in the portrayed action, or that while the action can hold our attention and rouse our feelings, we cannot be certain, indeed must remain uncertain, as to the possibilities of meaning." End quote. From the mid-19th century on, roughly from Flaubert on, this tendency becomes not merely common, but predominant. The only aspect of Howe's perspective one could criticize is that of transforming a socio-historical development into a philosophical problem. American literary criticism generally fixes the great artistic shift to a skepticism toward language and form in the middle of the 19th century which becomes the important demarcation point in recent art history, the beginning of the phase usually referred to as modernism.
The new skepticism, the doubt that artistic language can be a medium for discussing norms and values, results in the dissociation of language from the traditional forms of narration, a view that can at least partially solve the difficulties in Poggioli's approach. In other words, high literature's problematic status in commercial societies permeates its form. Such literature no longer refers positively to society by critically presenting norms and values, but rather attacks the ossification of society and its language in what amounts to intellectual guerrilla warfare. The modernist writer, according to Howe, quote, chooses subjects that disturb the audience and threaten its most cherished sentiments. Modern writers find that they begin to work at a moment when the culture is marked by a prevalent style of perception and feeling, and their modernity consists in a revolt against this prevalent style, an unyielding rage against the official order, end quote. Flaubert's Dictionnaire des Idées Reçues in which he collected the slogans and cliches of his era, was from this standpoint symptomatic for a new phase of art history whose basic characteristics have supposedly determined art ever since. Peter Berger denies that the radical turning point conventionally set in the mid-19th century exists. Berger would find in our domestic debate about modernism an assumption that obscures the much more radical shift from aestheticism to the historical avant-garde at the beginning of our century. For Berger, the, development, the developing skepticism toward language and the change in the relation of form and content characteristic of symbolism and aestheticism was from the beginning inherent in the developmental logic of the institution art, i.e. the specific institutionalization of the commerce with art in bourgeois society. Even if the autonomous art of bourgeois culture in the late 18th century criticized society through its contents, it was separated by its form, which includes the institutionalization of the commerce with art from the mainstream of society. According to Berger, the development leading to symbolism and aestheticism can be best described as a transformation of form into content. As art becomes problematic to itself, form becomes the preferred content of the works. Quote, the app Part, the apartness from the praxis of life that had always constituted the institutional status of art in bourgeois society now becomes the content of works, end quote, page 27. In other words, the development from the autonomy of art in the 18th century to the aestheticism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries is, in Berger's perspective, an intensification of art's separation from bourgeois society. In arguing so, Berger departs radically from the, historic, from the history of the avant-garde as it is perceived in this country. He insists that the tendency inherent in art's autonomous status drove both the individual work and the institution art to increasingly extreme declarations of their autonomy. What the debate about modernism, modernism generally refers to as the writer's skepticism toward language and meaning since the mid-19th century Berger considers to be an increasing consciousness on the part of the artist of writing techniques, how material is applied, and its potential for effect. <clears throat> this consciousness corresponds historically to the aesthetic sensitizing of art's audience. Berger sees this development as logical and necessary, yet as negative, since it leads toward a state in which art works are characterized by semantic atrophy. It is evident at this point that I must further discuss Berger's implicit assumption that art has a socially consequential role only when it is somehow related to a socially relevant discussion of norms and values, and thus to the cognition of society as a whole. For Berger, there is no point in valorizing the purely aesthetic experience that motivates aestheticist texts. In contrast to, for example, Julia Kristeva, Berger does not provide a critical analysis of the potential that modernist texts possess for deconstructing ideological closures. According to him, aestheticist art severs itself consistently from all social relevance, establishing itself as a medium of purely aesthetic experience, quote, means become available as the category content withers, end quote, page 20. In avant-garde and kitsch, Clement Greenberg described the same phenomenon in these terms. Quote, in turning his attention away from subject matter of common experience, the poet or artist turns it in upon the medium of his own craft, end quote. 
Berger sees this development as the historical precondition for the development of art at the beginning of our century. Aestheticism's intensification of artistic autonomy and its effects on the foundation of a special realm called aesthetic experience permitted the avant-garde to clearly recognize the social inconsequentiality of autonomous art and, as a logical consequence of this recognition, to attempt to lead art back into social praxis. For Berger, then, the development of the avant-garde has nothing to do with a critical consciousness about language, it is not a continuation of tendencies already present in aestheticism. Rather, for him, the turning point from aestheticism to the avant-garde is determined by the extent to which art comprehended the mode in which it functioned in bourgeois society, its comprehension of its own social status. The historical avant-garde of the 20s was the first movement in art history that turned against the institution art and the mode in which autonomy functions. In this, it differed from all previous art movements whose mode of existence was determined precisely by an acceptance of autonomy. Even from a hasty review of Berger's historical reconstruction, I trust it is clear that Berger accomplishes what was impossible for Poggioli, impossible because of Poggioli's sweeping criteria. Berger gives us a historically concrete and theoretically exact description of the avant-garde. Pagliari's theory is at least a, is at best a theory of modernism that explains certain basic characteristics of artistic production since the middle of the 19th century, and perhaps since Goethe and Wordsworth. His book is vulnerable owing to his inability to determine the qualitative and not just the quantitative difference between romanticism and modernism. Yet in his tendency to equate modernism and the avant-garde and to subsume both under the label modernism Bogioli typifies the Anglo-American tradition. It is no coincidence that John Waitzman gave his book of 1973 on this subject the title, The Concept of the Avant-Garde, Explorations in Modernism. And Irving Howe uses the, the two terms interchangeably, quote, the modernist writers and artists constitute an avant-garde, end quote. The equation of the two terms stems from an inability to see that the theoretical emphases of modernist and avant-garde writers are radically different. If the artistic strategies of modernism and the avant-garde could be reduced to strategies of purely linguistic negation, one might be justified in attempting to articulate an all-inclusive theory of modernism. Poggioli wrote that the, quote, avant-garde looks and works like a culture of negation, end quote, and he chose to emphasize a strategy of negation in avant-garde writings concentrating on language, cultural boundaries, and the various ways culture had become ossified. At first glance, the attempt to develop a theory of the avant-garde that also functions as a theory of modernism seems perfectly acceptable. Evidence such as the Surrealist Manifestos in which Breton made a modernist attack against the one-dimensionality of conventional forms of thought and language appeared to support the case. The first manifesto of surrealism, for example, includes his criticism of Dostoevsky's mania for realistic description, which is basically a modernist critique of realism's tendency to use conventional language patterns. Although Berger would concede these similarities, his major argument concerns the differences between aestheticism and the avant-garde. If we focus on the precarious status of art in modern societies, the institution of art we can see the radical difference between the strategies of negation with, within modernism and within the avant-garde. Modernism may be understandable as an attack on traditional writing techniques, but the avant-garde can only be understood as an attack meant to alter the institutionalized commerce with art. The social roles of the modernist and the avant-garde artist are thus radically different. Up to this point, I've been more descriptive than analytical. In the next section, I will analyze some of the social, historical, and philosophical presuppositions of the two most prevalent and also most interesting theories of modernism, those proceeding from Adorno and from French post-structuralism. <coughs> In this way, I will set the stage for my analysis of Peter Berger's theory and what I see as its implications. Two, the social and political implications of the major theories of modernism. 
Two philosophical and historical modes of understanding the avant-garde can be distinguished. These modes have contrary anthropological, social, and philosophical implications. One proceeds from what seems to be an infinitely variable opposition between solidification and dissolution, representation and life, metaphysical closure and deconstruction, general and particular, quantity and quality. The other proceeds from the historical observation that the mass media and official ideological discourses tend to destroy and expropriate individual languages in the interests of domination. This second mode of thought juxtaposes the state of expropriation with a utopian state in which dominated social groups reappropriate language, allowing it once again to become a medium for expressing the needs and material, concrete experiences of individuals and groups. It can thus counterbalance the powers that strive to dominate socially. The first mode of thought can be associated generally with Breton, Artaud, Barthes, Adorno, and Derrida. The other can be associated with Brecht, Benjamin, and Negt and Cluj. The social implications of Peter Berger's unique reconstruction of the history of modernism in the avant-garde can best be appreciated if he is arrayed against these two predominant theories of cultural politics. Thus, before proceeding with an analysis of Berger, I will take a closer look at the two modes, suggesting that the first, represented by Adorno, Derrida, and albeit in a less reflective manner by critics like Poggioli, tends necessarily towards social and political pessimism. A. Adorno's Theory of Modernity Adorno's concept of the interrelation of art and society is determined by his view of the development of liberal high capitalism since the middle of the 19th century. In the modern period, exchange value came to dominate society. All qualities had been reduced to quantitative equivalences. Adorno does not see this process as a fall from grace confined to the modern era only. The result of social, economic, and political decisions in the 19th century, or as one that might have been prevented. Rather, this process, which started with the beginning of human history, inheres in man's drive for self-preservation and in the ambivalent character of reason resulting from and accompanying this drive. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, Adorno, together with Horkheimer, reflected on, quote, the difficulties in the concept of reason, end quote, namely, that it signifies, on the one hand, the general interest of man and, quote, the idea of a free human social life, end quote, as in, and is, on the other hand, quote, the court of judgment of calculation, end quote, quote, ratio of capital, end quote, instrument of domination and means for the most rational exploitation of nature. The human necessity of material self-preservation determines the elements of truth in instrumental reason, i.e. that mode of reason which, quote, which adjusts the world for the ends of self-preservation and recognizes no function other than the preparation of the object from mere sensory material in order to make it that material of subjugation, end quote. But from the necessary use of reason for the ends of self-preservation of humankind follows its equally necessary but dangerous ossification as an instrument. Instrumental reason takes two forms, as technological reason developed for purposes of dominating nature, and as social reason directed at the means of domination aimed at exercising social power. The result to dominate nature the desire to dominate nature led in the course of human history at first to the stripping of external nature of all qualities. In its attempts to use nature in technical and manipulative ways, instrumental reason comes to regard nature as the other, as controllable, and subjects it to a conceptual scheme in which relations are reduced to being purely quantitative. Quote, Enlightenment recognizes as being an occurrence only what can be apprehended in unity. Its ideal is the system from which all and everything follows, end quote. This tendency, predetermined by the drive for self-preservation, comes to pervade in Adorno's view little by little all the spheres of human life, including the organization of society in which the relationships of individuals to each other are determined by the power mentality, and the quantification of inner nature for the purpose of commercially exploiting standardized needs. While high or liberal capitalism was being established, this exploitation became the universal principle of a society that sought to subjugate everything to the same principle. Quote, bourgeois society is ruled by equivalence, end quote. 
These and similar considerations give a pessimistic cast to Adorno's critical theory as it pertains to social praxis. In negative dialectics, he wrote that people's, quote, overall condition moves towards a personality and a sense of anonymity, end quote. What individual subjects are faced with is not society as a determining context within which they preserve a relative freedom of action, but rather one, quote, overall condition of living human beings, end quote, i.e. one general subject that, as a product of historical dialectics, is for the individual subjects the, quote, functional context objectively preceding them, end quote. Quote, dwelling in the core of the subject are the objective conditions, end quote, since the general subject humankind has in the course of history subjugated itself to the universal rule of quantifying thought and behavior, the subjects are already caught in the vicious circle of quantified forms of domination. Only in the subject-centered sense does Adorno speak of the, quote, capitalist system's increasingly integrative trend of the fact that its elements entwine into a more and more total context of functions, end quote. The means by which this integration is attained for the mass public is the culture industry. Again and again, in Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno refer to the increasingly, quote, complete quantification, end quote, of the public through the culture industry, quote, under monopoly, all mass culture is identical, and the lines of its artificial framework begin to show through. Manipulation of the masses succeeds relentlessly, according to Horkheimer's and Adorno's interpretation, since, quote, the unity of the system grows ever, ever stronger in the circle of, manipula of manipulation and retroactive need, end quote. Consequently, art can be understood as at best an endangered medium that resists the general tendency but lacks any social influence derived from a communicable content. Only a few intellectual aristocrats remain positioned to counter the subjugating forces of the times through an art that aids in resisting the conformity to society. Adorno ad adheres, as, the, as does Lukács, to the Hegelian axiom that art must be related to social totality. But for Adorno, art does not reflect on and communicate with society. Rather, it resists society. He sees the relation of art to reality no longer as one of the discerning critique, but as one of absolute negation. Pure art is a medium cleansed of all practical interests, in which, among other things, the individual can negate the ossified linguistic and mental cliches that are the results of instrumental rationality. Art thus becomes the medium of hibernation in bad times. Quote, the the asocial in art is the definite negation of the definite society. What art contributes to society is not communication with society, rather something very indirect, resistance, end quote. Close reading of this theory reveals the futility of criticizing Adorno, as does Michael Ryan, for, quote, attempting to substitute philosophical or ideological criticism for, among other things, the political, economic, and the sexual political struggles, end quote. Adorno saw more clearly than Ryan and other left-tending deconstructionists that a philosophical theory claiming that progress may be realized in society must also be willing to name a social agency for this, incapable of discovering such an agency within society and thus of securing progress philosophically. Adorno drew the pessimistic conclusion that he must develop philosophical strategies of hibernation. Herein lies the reason that Adorno's social analyses analysis led to a periodization of modern art that places the true beginning of artistic modernism around the mid-19th century, sees the essence and the unity of modernism in mistrust for the word as bearer of meaning, that is, as a bearer of norms and values that can be mediated, and directs its entire energy toward the negation of ossified language and thought forms. In his essay, Looking Back on Surrealism, Adorno integrates the historical avant-garde of the 20s into this concept of a modernism breaking with society. Quote, the subject, freely controlling himself, free of all concern for the empirical world and having become absolute, exposes himself as lacking animation, virtually as dead in the face of the total reification which throws him back entirely on himself in his protest. The dialectical images of surrealism are those of a dialectic of subjective freedom in a state of objective unfreedom. If today, however, surrealism seems itself to be obsolete, 
is because people already deny themselves that consciousness of denial that is contained in the negativity of surrealism. Surrealism, like modernism in general, is reduced here to an artistic strategy of protest against society. Adorno's concept and periodization of modernism and his pessimistic social analysis are two sides of the same coin. Derrida, B, Derrida and modernism. Questions of periodization and of social analysis can obviously not play the same role for Derrida as they do for Adorno, since Derrida's concerns seems to be purely epistemological. Nevertheless, as soon as Derrida and his followers apply his method of reading for other than purely epistemological purposes, they display a conception of modernism that is basically congruent with Adorno's. In other words, as soon as Derrida goes beyond epistemological reflections to literary analysis, it becomes apparent that the theme of socio-political pessimism that Adorno expresses openly is implicit in Derrida's thought as well. It is no coincidence that in the few cases where Derrida eulogizes the thought of a literary author, his praise goes to two surrealist avant-garde writers, Antonin Artaud and Georges Bataille. We can begin to see the significance of Derrida's attitude toward modernism by examining his reaction to this statement of Artaud about the theater of cruelty. Quote, I have therefore said cruelty as I might have said life, end quote. Derrida writes, Artaud's theater of cruelty is not a representation, it is life itself, an extent to which life is unrepresentable. Life is a non-representable origin of representation. This life carries man along with it, but is not primarily the life of man. The latter is only a representation of life, and such is the limit, the humanist limit, of the metaphysics of classical theater." End quote. Although life as the origin of representation, that is, as that power and movement that predestines all structuring of artistic material and all differential articulation of meaning, cannot be thought of as the strict opposite of representation, nonetheless, it is significant that Derrida reveals here a clear and neat oppositional structure of thought. Derrida's analysis of the modernist theater is based on a dichotomy. This is the case despite any dialectical gestures he may make in the direction of mediation. He shows the sharpness of the dichotomy by juxtaposing two forms of the theater, one positive for him and the other clearly negative. In his essay, The Theater of Cruelty and the Closure of Representation, Derrida speaks disdainfully of traditional theater because it is theological. It is dominated, quote, by the layout of a primary logos which does not belong to the theatrical site and governs it from a distance. The stage is theological for as long as its structure, following the entirety of tradition, comports the following elements, an author-creator who, absent and from afar, is armed with a text and keeps watch over, assembles, regulates the time or the meaning of representation, letting this latter represent him as concerns what is called the content of his thought, his intentions, his ideas. Derrida sets Artaud's theater in sharp contrast to this very exclusive theatrical form. In Artaud's theater, quote, the logical and discursive intentions which speech ordinarily uses in order to ensure its rational transparency, end quote, are reduced and subordinated, quote, in order to purloin the theater's body in the direction of meaning, end quote. This kind of theater achieves the very incorporation of life, not the representation of life, and in doing so, it, quote, lays bare the flesh of the world, lays bare the world's sonority, intonation, intensity, the shout that the articulations of language and logic have not yet entirely frozen, end quote, and it constructs a stage, quote, whose clamor has not yet been pacified into words, end quote. In this essay and in others, Derrida contrasts Artaud with the avant-garde theater with the tradition of Western theological theater with the same incisiveness he employs in contrasting his own philosophy with the metaphysical tradition of Western philosophy. He finds in the avant-garde praxis of the theater of cruelty an analog for the praxis of deconstruction. The theater of cruelty is the undoing of the theater of representation in the way that deconstruction is the undoing of metaphysical closures. To demonstrate the connection of Derrida's philosophy to modernism, I must set out some basic traits of that philosophy. Derrida's stress is first on language, but language is emphasized as the means to unlocking other issues.
Derrida argues that language is a differential and material system, itself never closed or total, but in perpetual motion. Language as such not only structures thought, but is also engraved and imprinted in all thought. Our discursive cognition and evaluation of reality is, in other words, predetermined by a trans-subjective linguistic field, whose construction is effected by the constant but never fully successful effort of metaphysical or logocentric exclusions and closures. Derrida, however, is not so much interested in the simple fact that thought is determined by language as in the consequences that this thesis has for the conception of a perceiving and signifying subject. He begins by criticizing and moving beyond the structuralist thesis that posits automatic and closed language systems, universally determining human culture. Derrida shows that the structuralist assumption of such a system is caught in the snares of metaphysical thinking as well, since it proceeds from the notion of a totalized system of the signified. Although the positing of such a system is supposed to desubstantialize meaning and thus to deconstruct the concept of a subject as epistemological center, structuralism still works with the notion of a system of representation, a system that in principle can still be appropriated by a perceiving subject. By showing how the play of the signifier constantly undermines human efforts to arrest meaning, e.g. through the working of tropes and images, Derrida not only subjects to thorough criticism the notion of representation, but also that of a perceiving subject who can acquire systems of representation. The inevitable epistemological consequence of this is that the subject no longer can be conceived of as a self-assured center of his opinions and perceptions. He's always lost in the chain and the texture of signifiers. In spite of all the self-glorifying intentionality he may display, the subject as a center of thought is necessarily disseminated in the field of language. And this means in the field of language whose structure is determined by the structure of the signifiers, the differential articulation of phonetic material. This forces Derrida to constantly read the works of other thinkers in a critical manner to prove that these works characteristically repress the constitutive import of the signifier, a repression that leads epistemologically to the hypostatization of the subject as the center of will and knowledge, and to the solidification of an allegedly objectifiable systematic knowledge in the form of lococentric or metaphysical closures. Derridian terms such as repetition and presence have to be understood in this context. The self-confident subject of idealistic cognition theory conceives of himself as self-present, i.e. his presence is allegedly determined by his own autonomous activities. Such a self regards language as merely the belated embodiment and representation of content previously present in his own consciousness, but fails to recognize that every sign is a priori constituted by the possibility of its repetition, a repetition that implies that consciousness is a priori interwoven with the chain of signifiers. In his essay on Arto, Derrida writes, quote, For us there is no word, nor, in general, a sign which is not constituted by the possibility of repeating itself. A sign which does not repeat itself, which is not already divided by repetition in its first time, is not a sign. The signifying referral, therefore, must be ideal, and ideality is but the assured power of representation in order to refer to the same thing each time. This is why being is the key word of eternal repetition, the victory of God and of death over life, end quote. It is interesting that here a positive ideal takes shape, that of life and non-repetition, whose realization is in the hands not only of post-structuralism's deconstructive praxis, but equally of the artistic praxis of the avant-garde. The writing practice of artistic modernism has always tended to deconstruct meaning by questioning the author as a center who provides meaning to the artistic process of creation and shifts the accent of creative praxis from the chain of the signified to the chain of signifiers. This favored linguistically productive texts over representative texts. Artaud seems to best illustrate for for Derrida, the positivity of the avant-garde art program. Not only is he against, quote, all ideological theater, all cultural theater, all communicative, interpretive theater, seeking to transmit a content, 
or to deliver a message, end quote, he works on the outline and foundation of a positive, constructive theater, since the, quote, profound essence of Artaud's project, his historical metaphysical decision, end quote, is, quote, Artaud wanted to erase repetition in general, non-repetition, expenditure that is resolute and without return in the unique time consuming the present, must put an end to fearful discursiveness, to unskirtable ontology, to dialectics, end quote. Derrida's praise of the avant-garde, just as his own practice of philosophical and logical deconstruction of traditional texts, remains internally dependent on its adversary, the idealistic theory of cognition with its presumed concept of the self-assured subject. This dependency may be acceptable as long as Derrida stays within the field of epistemological reflection, as long as within this field he can demonstrate the universal predominance and influence of idealistic, idealistic cognition theories, as well as their shortcomings. But as soon as he goes beyond the realm of epistemology, this dependency opens itself to criticism. For example, discourses aimed at criticizing or organizing social praxis may be unable to avoid working with quote, metaphysical closures, end quote. The epistemological project of pointing out metaphysical closures in any discourse may be of epistemological import. It is not necessarily relevant for the philosophical reflection of social practice. Even in subverting idealist epistemology, deconstructive thinking remains dependent on the opposition, quote, true versus false, end quote. By allowing this opposition to structure philosophical or theoretical reflection as a whole, it excludes theorizing centered on the relative opposition, right versus wrong. In other words, post-structuralist thought tends to subordinate the pragmatic question of the conceivable to the question of truth. By what means is this operation justified? Is it enough to assert that every thought working with, quote, metaphysical closures, end quote, falls prey to the illusion of possessing truth? That the need for an answer to this question seems to be especially pressing within literary criticism is in itself a testimony to the post-structuralist tendency to expand beyond the realm of epistemology. This expansion determines, for example, which body of literary texts we find especially valuable or paradigmatic for literature's potential in modern times, it determines our conception and assessment of modernism and the cultural political choice between representative or linguistically productive texts it influences the institutional commerce with literature in different spheres of public life. It thus is ensnared in social praxis without reflecting on this entanglement. Herein lie the limitations of Derrida's concept of modernism. His own philosophical praxis remains a strategy of negation. It remains dependent on what it deconstructs. The problem is that once Derrida gets beyond questions of epistemology, which may be subject to analysis in terms of truth and falsity, to questions of art, he fails to relate art to social praxis, where questions of truth and falsity must give way to questions of right and wrong. Derrida seems to subordinate the question of action solely to the question of truth. I want to return to Adorno as a way of coming to terms with both Derrida and Adorno and their notions of modernity. I want to work out here the idea I suggested at the beginning of this section, that is, that their conceptions of modernism are congruent. This is so, although Derrida's philosophical critique of sameness and self-identity at first glance seems to be incompatible with the positive notion that Adorno attributes to the concept of particular and self-identical qualities. He juxtaposes self-identical qualities with the logical hierarchy from the merely particular to the highest general that instrumental reason imposes upon reality and that subjects the elements of physical as well as social and human reality to a process of unification and quantification. Nevertheless, the basic thought structures of the philosophies of Adorno and Derrida are identical in very interesting ways. This identity goes well beyond the theoretical similarities pointed out by Ryan and Horish. Both philosophies critique a system of metaphysical closures that for reasons of domination, 
reduces differences or qualities to, com to comparable identities and that eliminates heterogeneity in favor of exchangeable homogeneity, but neither philosophy is oriented towards social practice. I reject the notion that the major difference between a Derrida and Adorno is that, is quote, that the critical lever for Derrida is logical or philosophical historical, whereas for Adorno, the lever is social, end quote. Adorno faced the consequences of his pessimistic social analysis and refuted the possibility of a lever that could possess appreciable social relevance. Here precisely lies the reason that aesthetic theory and art as a medium of its reflections shifts to the center of Adorno's thought. It trains artists and recipients of art in the power of reflection that art alone can scarcely accomplish, and thus strengthens art's resistance to everything social, which must be regarded as a complete context with delusion, of delusion. The sort of reflection that must take place for Adorno within the realm of art has an analog in the practice of deconstruction that Derrida urges us to engage in within the realm of philosophy. Neither of these mental activities is conceivable as a practice oriented toward the institutionalization of social progress. The sole difference between Adorno and Derrida in this regard is that Adorno addresses as a theme the plight of the intellectual isolated in his ivory tower, and he connects this situation to his social analysis. Derrida, on the other hand, does not even raise the question of how his philosophical practice could be institutionalized or socially mediated. He sticks simply to the development of an esoteric intellectual practice. The difference between Adorno and Derrida I have just touched upon is a significant one. If one wanted to refute Adorno's approach, one would have to start with his social analysis and prove its results to be inexact by, for example, discussing historical, politically and philosophically another social agency he overlooked, one that would permit progress and political engagement to be conceived of. Adorno himself was clearly aware of the significance of a social agency for an optimistic, progress-oriented social philosophy. As later socio-political pessimism arose, along with other ideas, from a development of his thought that in the course of the 30s made it impossible for him to continue seeing the proletariat as a historical subject whose existence guaranteed progress. Since he was unable to perceive any other social agent, which would not necessarily have to be a historical or general subject, but could, for example, be given with the structure of our psyche and its reaction to a reified world, his later philosophy centered on attempts at intellectual hibernation. If one wanted to refute Derrida's approach, one would have to start in an entirely different way. One could not base one's attack on the historical, political, or philosophical discussions of social agency because the question of the institutionalization of deconstruction as a social practice does not seem to interest Derrida. Therefore, a discussion of his social and historical premises has to begin at an even earlier point. It must begin with the structure of his thought, with his procedure of analyzing concepts in terms of dichotomies. For example, his contrast between the self-glorifying subject of idealistic epistemology versus the notion of meaning as the effect of the play of the signifiers. The structure of his practice of thinking is based on the exclusion of other possibilities of thought without in any way legitimizing this exclusion. This procedure limits the possibility of expanding the practice of deconstruction beyond the realm of epistemological concerns. Even within this realm, I find Derrida vulnerable to criticism because he does exactly what he accuses his adversary, the entire tradition of Western thought of doing. He gains the thrust of his arguments only by arguing antithetically against the subject of idealistic epistemology and against epistemological closures. But in doing so, he employs the same suspect strategies of exclusion. Adorno's practice of negation in the medium of art and Derrida's philosophical deconstructions are both deficient as social practices, but for slightly different reasons. Adorno wrestled with the problem of agency, but saw no solution for it at the same at the time. Derrida doesn't even deal with the crucial matter of agency. In the following, I can only hint at a possible answer to the question Adorno cannot answer and that Derrida simply does not address. I will, however, return to the matter in more detail at the end of the introduction. <laughs>
Theories of social practice are not interested in what is universally true, but in what is right in a specific historical situation. The discussion of social practice has to be concerned with action-oriented values, since any possible action is always already entangled in history or praxis. The values on the values on which it is based can never be absolute or true. It is, in my opinion, highly typical of the structuring and excluding effect of post-structuralist theorizing that even the most reflective colleagues trained in a deconstructive mode of thinking always hastily assume that the mere use of the term value implies some claim to the absolute validity of a position. The texts or our own entanglement in history or praxis allows valuations only within the framework of specific historical situations. These situations are not ideologically homogenous. The divergence of ideological positions within any such framework is a result of ruptures, inconsistencies, and contradictions within single discourses and between discourses, which can be perceived as interpretive strategies competing for domination. But the divergence of positions and the process of competition open up the possibility of reflecting on these differences politically and historically, and of evaluating them comparatively. A reasoning that defines itself negatively reveals forms of domination and exploitation in a specific historical context and deals with the roles that texts play in the struggle will end up taking sides. In contrast to such a position, the deconstructive reading of literature will always be self-locked in the toils of endless demystification. C. Beyond Adorno and Derrida on Modernism, Literature and Experience. The question whether something is right or wrong in a given historical framework displaces the epistemological question whether something is true or false. Thus, it may very well be that a subject does not first mean something that is subsequently expresses through language, which thus would be reduced to a tool available to us. It may also be that rather than being master of an objective world above which it stands, consciousness is instead an effect of social and unconscious processes which it could never fully know or control, that all models can provide, that provide general explanations of the world are to a certain extent theoretical fictions, end quote. But this does not contradict the necessity of discussing literary texts as representative texts, as models of human behavior, and as participants in the constant struggle for interpretive power within society. If anything, an overemphasis on epistemological questions prevents us from seeing that the literary media and the public spheres of cultural production are to be highly prized socially because they make it possible for individuals to work through their material experiences and understand them as consciously as they can. With its focus lack locked on the text as an order of signifiers, preordained by the given historical situation and on writing, as that which is engraved on us from this order, post-structuralism excludes from the start the possibility that there might exist a material organization of social reality external to language and imprinted on our psyche and physical being, written into our existence via the mechanisms of material as well as cultural reproduction. I don't mean to say that with the help of language, we could accurately recognize the physical psychic effect of the material organization of society on human beings. But what I have just posited could mean that this effect might cause a latent tension to develop between itself and the prevailing text of a period that the prevailing ideology of a historical situation organized in a text is designed to misinterpret those effects and thus to establish the precondition for illusory satisfaction which in turn is not only designed to deflect those psychic tensions or contradictions, but to stabilize the prevailing system of ideological and economic reproduction in a given society. Just as the play of signifiers contradicts and undermines any claim of possessing a well-defined, conceptually unequivocal, logocentric discourse, so material experience may contradict and undermine the prevalent ideology of a historical situation. <clears throat> 
And just as the struggle for interpretive power by imposing metaphysical closures attempts to restrain the play of signifiers, the prevailing ideology limits the means by which individuals may more or less consciously understand their material experiences. If what I've outlined is the case, that then the pre predominant ideology of a period could be interpreted as a strategy of textual domination with the goal of robbing the dominated groups, sexes, nations, and classes of the language necessary for interpreting their situation. The complete quantification of the public sphere by the culture industry that Horkheimer and Adorno refer to could be described as the expropriation of those heterogeneous languages with which individual experiences might remain interpretable without the individual being subjected to a complete identification with the generality. Mass media for Adorno, however, block from the start the interpretation of our sensuous material experiences through a dominating system of spectacles, images, and representations. The question I would pose and emphasize is whether this attempt to thoroughly dominate cultural life is necessarily successful. This question receives affirmative answers from Adorno explicitly and Derrida and deconstructive literary criticism implicitly. However, if material, unarticulated experiences exist, and if their effect is a psychic tension or contradiction of some kind, then different degrees of verbal approximation and thus of conscious understanding are possible. But where and how does this understanding take place? Whether these experiences remain on the subliminal level or are dealt with consciously depends on the access people have to a public sphere of production. This phrase means the discourses and institutions that can provide individuals or social groups with a medium in which to deal with subliminally felt experiences and learn to interpret these experiences on a more or less conscious and critical level. It may very well be that, to quote Paul de Man, in the, in, quote, the act of anthropological intersubjective interpretation, a fundamental discrepancy always prevents the observer from coinciding fully with the consciousness he is observing, end quote, and that the, quote, same discrepancy exists in everyday language and the impossibility of making the actual expression coincide with what it has to be expressed, of making the actual sign coincide with what it signifies, end quote. However, one should not allow this one element, this one aspect of how language works to be transformed into the only hermeneutically constitutive factor. We cannot dispense with the labor of approaching an understanding that can perhaps only fully unfold in a trial and error process and in an institutionalized public sphere of production. Oscar Negit and Alexander Kluge, who developed this concept of the public sphere of production in their book, Offenlichkeit und Erfahrung, Public Sphere and Experience, argued that only experience confirmed and corroborated through discussion and copied with a as collective experience and coped with as collective experience can be said to be truly experienced. Quote, the public sphere only possesses use value characteristics when social experience is organized in it, end quote. Literature and, more generally, storytelling have important functions for negative inclusion. What counts for them is not the distinction between a good or a bad story, but rather between heterogeneity and homogeneity. Quote, tell your story, end quote, means that you can deal with your experiences only by discussing them. Stories, of course, can easily be used for purposes of cultural domination as well, if they portray behavioral patterns detached from individual experiences. Abstract stories, such as the Horatio Alger myth, contribute just as much to the expropriation of language as do ideologically laden stereotypes. According to Negat and Kluge, the modern culture industry robs individuals of languages for interpreting self and world by denying them the media for organizing their own experiences. The consciousness industry does represent a public sphere of production, but one that takes consciousness as raw material or that constantly tries to sever the connection between concrete experiences and consciousness. A word about consciousness is in order. In such an approach as that of negative inclusions, 
Consciousness is neither conceived in the sense of idealistic epistemology as a static and self-sufficient center of a cognition striving for truth, nor in the post-structuralist sense of a text whose author is unknown. Consciousness, rather, is the historically concrete production of meaning that approximates an accurate articulation of sensuous material experiences. From this perspective, a chance exists to escape from the dissemination of intentions into the chain of signifiers, because every historical situation contains ideological ruptures and offers alternatives of thought on which depends the degree of the greater or lesser approximation to an understanding of material experience. In my view, literary criticism's major theoretical alternative today is not between a deconstructive or an idealistic theory of cognition, but between the positions expressed in these two questions. First, is the self with its historical, political, economico, sexual determinations, i.e. with its intellectual and material identity, in fact, quote, no more than an effect of a structural resistance to irreducible heterogeneity, end quote? Or second, are those different degrees of conceptual understanding of material experience is within which provisionally unified concepts are more than textual ruses to postpone the possibility of a radical heterogeneity? If the answer to the first question is yes, then any form of a praxis-oriented understanding of a historical situation is impossible. I believe, however, that only the second of my two questions can be answered with yes, and that we can escape the dissemination of attentions into the chain of signifiers. The ideological ruptures in every historical situation enable us to develop alternatives of thought that do approximate an understanding of experience. I'm going to end it here We're on page uh, 29, section D. We're about we're pretty close to ending uh, this third section here, but I, I, I mean, I've been reading for now. I, we'll save it for the next day. The forward is going on for quite a while, and then there's like pretty lengthy introduction at the end of that. Eventually, we'll get to the text. Half of this book seems to be like uh, just supplementary material, and then the There's a fuck ton of notes at the end. Uh, until next time.